Welcome to the Reader Roundtable, where authors from all walks of life come together to discuss the trials, tribulations, and triumphs of publishing their books. I'm your host, Corey Graham. Join us here every Friday night at 8 p.m. or listen anytime via podcast at Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, TuneIn, and PodServe, to name just a few. The Author Roundtable is sponsored by Reader House Online Bookstore, where the independent new authors come first. How to Love from the Soul, a guide for the new generation. It's the name of the new book. It just hit store shelves. It's written by Margaret Clark. And we get to talk all about this book right here at the Reader House Author Roundtable. Margaret is right here with me. Margaret, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for being here tonight. All right. I'm glad to be here. I'm really glad you're here, too. I'm interested in this book, How to Love from the Soul. Margaret, can you tell me what readers are in store for here? They're in store for, they come a long way back. Our parents, I'm a sharecropper's daughter. Hmm. My parents love me from the soul and the heart. They say they loved us deep down. And my dad say, we love you all from the soul and the heart. And I was trying to figure that out as being a child growing up. But as I got older, I understood what they meant about loving from the soul. Mm. You got to love God first because he first loved us from his soul. And we was taught that as we was growing up as children of parents that were sharecroppers. They taught us how to love people how to trust in ourselves, believe in ourselves, follow your dream. And as I grow up, I started this new journey. Long time ago, I wanted to be a writer Hmm. because I paid attention to what loving from the soul is. Loving from the soul is, it comes from deep within your heart and soul, not just from your mouth of saying, I love you. But you have to show love. You have to give love to receive love. And if you love from deep down in the soul, that's real love. I understand the encouragement behind this book is to inspire everyone to try to understand their mate or their significant other or even a family member. Because it can be really hurtful when those feelings aren't necessarily returned. Exactly. Exactly. We just have to go to them. If we pay attention to our significant other, our mate, our children, and just go to them, give them a hug and let them know you do love them from deep down within. Once you understand the love from deep down within yourself, you got to love yourself, trust in yourself, believe in yourself. This new journey that I started on of writing this book, I was putting pieces together, little notes. Little notes, little notes. And one day I'm like, I want to write a book. I want to make this a book. Mm, How long did that take you, Margaret? About two years. It took me about two years. I would take a note, put it in a little holder, write another note, pay attention. And when I grew up to be a grown person, I really realized what it meant to love from the soul. Mm. I had one person that really showed me love from deep down in the soul, from the heart, because he said that to me. He said, Margaret, you know, I love you from my soul. And I'm like, I heard that growing up. Hmm. I haven't heard anybody say that since then. But once you learn how to love from the heart and the soul, there's no separation. There's no name calling. We take the vows, but is we honoring the vows we took? They're going to wedding rings, the wedding dresses, and then here come the raft, Mm -hmm. the name calling. We weren't doing that at first, but once you learn how to love from the soul, it goes real deep. It goes real deep down in the heart. And that's how I learned. I learned that growing up, we was always taught love from the soul, baby, love from the heart and the soul. I know this book is going to inspire so many people, and I encourage everybody listening right now to go check this book out. It's titled How to Love from the Soul, a Guide for the New Generation. This is written by Margaret Clark. It's published by Newman Springs Publishing. 
and you can find it everywhere. So go to Amazon or go to Barnes & Noble or iTunes or traditional brick-and-mortar stores and you'll find it there. Margaret, thank you so much for coming on and telling me all about this wonderful book. I had such a nice time with you tonight. And thank you, and I had a nice time talking to you, too. And I just want to encourage every writer, when you start out your journey of writing, keep writing. Follow your dream. Start your new journey. Regular listeners of the Reader House Author Roundtable will be really happy to recognize a familiar voice. Dr. Stacy Burdick is back with me now. Doctor, thank you so much for being here again. Yes, of course. Well, it's really exciting. We're talking about a biopsychosocio-spiritual taxonomy. We've talked about this a few months ago when it was released, and now you've released the audiobook version. It's really exciting. So, Dr. Burdick, could you first of all catch us up a little bit and tell us about what you've written about in biopsychosocio-spiritual taxonomy? Well, really, that term biopsychosocial spiritual has to do with an adjective for pain, but mm. Because pain is a familiar experience for all humanity, for everybody. We all we all have an experience with pain, but we usually look at it in a negative sense. And, and the book really is an invitation to assess its positive invitation. It's, it's a type of negative reinforcement. And all taxonomy is is classification. It's just a term for classification. So really, the book is an effort to classify our experience with pain, but that pain at the same time is a very human experience. And it's interesting to note that although pain can be described either biopsychosocially or spiritually, that's really all categorically that it can be explained as is that that same term explains what it means to be human. Mm. And so at the same time that we're human, we're, we're experiencing pain. And what mediates our relationship with pain is a biopsychosocial, spiritual perspective. That's what the book has to offer. Mm. And like I said, the audiobook version has just been released from the Audiobook Network. Uh, Dr. Burdick, tell me about your thought. It's a hugely popular medium. And I think if you're writing now, you really should give a lot of consideration to the audiobook version. Uh, what was your thought going into this? Well, I really liked how it turned out. I had three voiceovers to choose from. That was the only limitation, which voice to choose to read it. And I think although it could be improved upon by maybe eliminating the acronyms from the narrative, but mm. that was my choice to leave the acronyms in there. So that's on me. But I really had a different experience in listening to the audio version, and, and my patients did too. They really liked the audio opportunity to listen to something on the way to work or something that is challenging or inviting to them. So what are you working on now, Dr. Burdick? Can we expect more books from you? Yeah, there are. I'm, uh, right now, I'm working on measuring the effects of pain. And with those measurements, I am creating a type of, uh, how can I say it, a digital application to assessment and therapy when it comes to how I'm feeling or anybody else who might purchase the mobile app, let's say. Hmm. So trying to, just like a video game captures the attention and the interest of a kid or an adult, I want a person's relationship with pain to be understood and experienced in, in more of a, a positive way. And so it's an adjustment in their perspective on a person's relationship with pain. It's not all negative. It's, it's, if it's negative, it's negative reinforcement in that it takes away or subtracts. It takes away the negative perspective of pain and realizing that there can be an improvement on desirable behavior and desirable outcomes if done through the interpretation of that book or later books. Hmm. Well, I think so many people will find help and hope in the pages of this book when they're listening to the audiobook. Of course, this is a biopsychosocio-spiritual taxonomy. It's written by Dr. Stacy Burdick, and it's published by the Audiobook Network. So get on Audible or go to the Apple iTunes Store or get on Amazon, and you'll get this audiobook there. 
Dr. Burdick, it's been great speaking with you again. I can't wait to do it again. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate the opportunity. Images of Mindfulness. Learn from the past, live in the present, leap into the future. That's the audiobook that just came out by Peggy D. Ferris, and we're going to talk all about it right here at the Reader House Author Roundtable. Peggy's sitting down right next to me. Peggy, welcome. Thank you for joining me. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. Well, the pleasure's all mine. Uh, Peggy, can you tell me about Images of Mindfulness? Well, Images of Mindfulness, it's an accumulation of a lot of different stories, short stories all through it. And actually, it's actual happenings. Everything in there actually happened. Mm. But it has a message. So there, there are stories, but there's an inspirational message to try to make people feel better and do better. Was there a certain group of readers that you were speaking to here? Well, when I started this, it was during the pandemic. And I was uh, just trying to make people feel better over the pandemic and because I still I didn't know. And people began to tell me, said, I want this in a book. I want to be able to read this and keep this. And so I decided that actually the readers are the people who want to inspire, be inspired and want to do better and just to see something in life that they can live for. Mm. And when it comes to writing and publishing, having your work distributed, Peggy, have you ever done anything like this before? Well, I did Secrets of Successful Art because I'm also an artist. I had a studio since 1980s, you know, it's quite a long time ago. And then I had art gallery until the pandemic. And I'm very involved in art. In fact, Images of Mindfulness, the book, I have images of my paintings. And I'm more inspirational as well. Hmm. well. Once you got the idea, Peggy, and you sat down and began writing Images of Mindfulness, how long of a process was it until it got ready to send out? It went for a couple of years of just sharing it with other people. And then after the request so many times to put it into a book, I rewrote some of them and put them together. And I would say a couple of years altogether. And of course, the audio book just came out, but you also got the physical copy. And that day comes when it finally arrives. You get to hold it for the first time, Peggy. What kind of a moment was that like? It was really more, here I've got something that people can read and can see and mm. maybe help them a little bit. I want them to feel more inspired. And so it was something physical that they could take or that in the audio they can listen to it. A lot of people listening to us, Peggy, are authors just starting out and everything. Have you learned anything along the way that you could pass along to them? Any words of wisdom? Well, write something that you really know. Something, I know you hear this a lot, but it really is true. Write something that you have a burning desire for. If you can feel it, they can feel it. If you feel it when you're writing, it's something that you really believe in, something that you really want to know more about and share about, then they can feel it when they read it. I do these stories in my sermon as well because I'm an ordained minister. Mm. I have my doctorate in ministry. And so in my sermons, I use stories. And in my stories, I'll use sermons. So it, it works together. Peggy, are you working on anything now? Do you have any plans for writing in the future? I'm teaching a Bible study that I'm developing myself on the prophets, the uh, minor prophets and the major prophets. And so I'm putting this together and teaching it and seeing how the reaction is from the classes. And that will be my next book. Hmm. And Peggy, when you're writing and all of a sudden maybe you're stuck for ideas or maybe you don't know where to take things next, how do you get your inspiration flowing again? These stories that I have are all, they actually happened. I can see, yeah, I can take a subject. I've lived a long time. <laughs> and I can take a subject and something's happened around that particular subject. If you talk about Christmas or if you talk about trips or if you talk about going for a hike, I've done all that. And so as I began to think about the things I've done and just see how, like, my house was destroyed in a tornado in 2013 and we were in it at the time. Wow. We were in the safe room. The day before, I stood out by the house, and I looked to the east at Shawnee, Oklahoma, because the tornado hit there. It had destroyed homes, and I was so sorry for these people because I thought their homes were destroyed. And the very next day, I was in the same position, standing on the destruction of my home. Well, one of the stories in the, in the book is about that tornado and how it affected me and how you can be inspired by it. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of readers will be inspired by this book, and I encourage everyone listening out there to go check this out. It's titled Images of Mindfulness, Learn from the Past, Live in the Present, Leap into the Future. This is written by Peggy D. Ferris, and it's published by the Audiobook Network. So head over to Audible or the Apple iTunes Store or Amazon, and you can pick this one up. 
Peggy, thank you so much again for joining me and telling me all about your work. I enjoyed our time together. Thank you for having me. The book I'm looking at now is an informative and effective way to introduce more preventative measures into your daily life. It's titled, An Ounce of Prevention is Worth More Than You Can Imagine. It's written by Alan Doherty, and he's sitting right here with me now at the Reader House Author Roundtable. We get to talk all about this book. Alan, welcome. Thank you for being here. Thank you very much. I certainly enjoy being with you. Now, Alan, this is the audiobook version. Uh, when readers crack this open, when they put this on their phones to listen to, what are they in store for here? They're in store for a tremendous value on what they can do to minimize risk in their life. It's actually the key to longevity. It really is. People don't think about it that much, but we all have risk. It's basically just a part of life. But whenever you think about it, we do things every day that can either increase risk and also decrease any known risk that we might have. And this book really brings some of those things to mind and some of the reasons why we actually unknowingly increase the risk of developing perhaps a terminal illness or being involved in a lethal or at least a very serious accident. Mm. So I think that's the main gist of the entire book is just to change our mindset and make us aware that no matter how much money we have, no matter how successful we are in life or how happy we are, if we don't have health that is good enough to enjoy it or live long enough to enjoy it, it doesn't really do us any good. Wow, this is so important, Alan. What was your inspiration for writing this? I've been in the medical field for almost 50 years, and I've been taking care of patients. And it's just amazing sometimes how many of the accidents, the deaths, and the illnesses that I've seen could have and should have been prevented. Whenever you take care of people that long and you start thinking, you know, it actually would be a lot more beneficial to prevent some of these things and to have to wait till people actually experience them than, you know, help them progress along their life treating them. So, you know, one day in particular, I was taking care of someone and, you know, I just couldn't happen to ask what happened. He was in an accident. And of course, he was cooking something on the stove. It caught on fire. He immediately threw a bunch of water on the fire and mm. it just splattered all over the place, got all over his arm, burned it pretty badly. And I was talking to him about the fact that water is not what you really throw on a grease fire. Right. And he said, you know, here's what he said. He said, you know. I just really wasn't thinking. And that's the key to the first part of this book, is that we do so much subconsciously without thinking, and that actually causes more risk in our life. And the same thing with health. I mean, so many of us have such a busy lifestyle, and we have so many things going on. We don't feel like we have time to have preventive health care, like screenings and like doctor appointments and making sure we get all the tests that are recommended or in nutritional meals or exercising. All those things, if they're not done well, can actually cause us to have increased risk. Heart disease is still the number one killer in the United States, followed by cancer, number two, and unintentional accidents are number four. So when you're talking about preventive health and safety, it's a huge, huge thing to think about. And Alan, once you sat down to write this, was it a lengthy process for you? It actually wasn't because I had so many different examples and so many different things that I can relate to them from my own life, unfortunately. <laughs> you know, we learn best by mistakes. But uh, I was able to sit down and start thinking about why people don't take the time. For example, we don't think about warnings when we see them. We ignore warning signs. On every pack of cigarettes, there's a warning that says this can cause lung cancer, yet almost 47% of the people in the United States still smoke. So they're ignoring the warnings. We don't slow down when the road says slow down. We go out on thin ice, even though it's thin. We don't think about these things. We see commercials on TV all the time with people holding a voice box up to their throat speaking because they had throat cancer and had to have half their throat removed. These things don't bother us anymore. So it was like someone's got to put this in print and get this to the place where we can get it out to the masses and at least let them take a look at it and think about it. Well, I think a lot of people are going to be helped by this book. I encourage everybody listening to seek this one out. It's titled, An Ounce of Prevention is Worth More Than You Can Imagine. 
course, this is written by Alan Doherty, published by the Audiobook Network. So head over to Audible or the Apple iTunes Store or Amazon, and you can find us there. Alan, thank you again for coming on the show and telling me all about your work. This is such an important book. Thanks again. Thank you so much. I so enjoyed being with you tonight. Author Deborah Chambers has just released the audiobook, The Founding, The Chronicles of Bradenhurst Academy. Deborah is joining me here right now at the Reader House Author Roundtable, and we get to talk all about it. Deborah, welcome. Thank you so much for joining me. Well, thank you for having me. It's my pleasure. It's so exciting. The audiobook of The Founding is out. Can you tell me all about this book? Simply put, it's about a band of mercenaries who've retired. They want to make a difference in the world, so they're starting an academy to teach children how to take care of themselves and the adventures that they go through the first year. Mm. When you think about the kinds of readers that you were writing for here, Deborah, was it kind of that target audience, the young adult audience? Yes, it is. So I think it probably would also interest older people, too. Before I put it out, I had several test readers, children and adults. Can you go back and think about where the inspiration for the story came from and how you got the idea? Well, I was a tabletop gamer, and I did live-action role-playing, hmm. and takes a lot of imagination. And basically, it's my experiences for tabletopping and my live-action role-playing that inspired this book. Hmm. What does your writing background look like, Deborah? Have you ever done this kind of thing before? Well, I've been writing since I was probably in fourth grade, different kind of genres. My live-action role-playing, I wrote a few games. Oh, wow. This is the very first book I've ever published. Oh, congratulations. It's such a huge deal. Uh, now, being that it was your first novel, did it take you a long time? It took me a little over a year. <laughs> and then after that year, you know, it's a lot of work that goes into this kind of thing. What was that moment like when you got that first physical copy and you got to hold your own book for the first time? I was excited. <laughs> this has been my dream of having written my first book and getting it published. And it holds a very special place in my heart. A lot of people who are listening to us right now, Deborah, are authors who are also just starting out. Now, based on everything you learned along the way, do you have any words of advice that you could offer? Yes. If you have a local writing group like I do, join it. Mm. Get some ideas from those who also have been through it. I joined a local group before I actually wrote this book, and they helped a lot. Now, if I were to guess, Deborah, I'd say that there will be more books after this. Would I be right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> the second book is probably going to the publisher within the next month. Oh, fantastic. Now, Deborah, when you sit down to write, like in the founding, did you know where everything was going to go from beginning to end? Did you have an outline or did you just sit down with an idea and start going with it? I sat down with the idea and started going with it. Mm. <laughs> it worked for me anyway. Did you find that maybe the characters or the story kind of changed from what you had originally intended once you started writing? Oh, yes. Yes. The basic idea is still the same, but my characters evolved as I wrote because basically I would sit down with my computer and I'd think of something and I'd just write it down and I've got notes all over my computer as to how things were started out and then how they changed before the book came all together. And it's something that hits a lot of us writers, Deborah. It's writer's block. It's the worst. Does that kind of thing hit you from time to time? And then if it does, how do you get out of that? Well, yes, it does. And when that happens, I normally just close my computer up and then walk away for a while. Mm. <laughs> it's normally, I don't know if it works for everybody, but normally stepping back from what I was doing normally helps me unwind a little bit and open myself up to new ideas. Mm. We're talking about how much time and work goes into this. So when you think back over it all, Deborah, now what's the most rewarding aspect to you of being a published author? Now that it's in Audible, which I always had planned this to be a book that read well out loud, mm. the fact that it's now in an Audible form is really my best accomplishment, I think. Well, this sounds like a book a lot of people are going to love. I encourage you to check this out. It's titled The Founding. The Chronicles of Bradenhurst Academy. This is written by Deborah Chambers, and it's published by the Audiobook Network. 
You can find it on Audible. You can find it at the Apple iTunes Store. You can get it at Amazon. Anywhere you get your audiobooks, you'll find it. Deborah, it's been so nice having you on the show and learning all about your work. I hope we get to talk again sometime. All right. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Two men hope to find what they seek in the small town of Stone Ridge. That all happens in the new book written by R.L. Mata, Prairie Moon, Blue Moon Bar and Cafe. The author, Robert, is sitting right here with me now at the Reader House Author Roundtable, and we get to talk all about this book. Robert, welcome. Thank you for joining me. Thank you so very much, Clara. I really appreciate it. Can you tell me what readers can expect when they open up Prairie Moon, Blue Moon Bar and Cafe? Yes. Prairie Moon, Blue Moon Bar and Cafe is actually the second book of the Prairie Moon trilogy. Its Mm. main characters are Roy Mathis and a priest by the name of Father Hingman. Roy heads to Stone Ridge, Colorado, in search of his father and sister. Even more important are dreams he keeps having that seem to possess his very being, demanding that he come to this town to learn of their importance to his life. The other character, Father Hingman, had been banished to Stone Ridge by the church because of his exposure and a torrid conduct with young charges. Little does the church know, this very town is where the priest grew up and began his nefarious ways. Both lives ultimately intersect and reveal the priest played a part in Roy's father's painful past. Where did the idea for this story come from, Robert? What was the spark that lit your inspiration? It actually, the spark was from a little nugget of mine that kind of grew from a history, a piece of my past. Unfortunately, it was a not a rather pleasant experience, but hmm. it kind of broadened from there. And then some historical research that I had done, sadly, of priest abuse in Colorado, hmm. although the book is fiction. Robert, were you writing toward a specific group of readers? Do you think there's a group of readers out there that would enjoy this the most? The trilogy is about the struggles of relationships and environments that not only are challenging because of the physical location of where one lives, but also to the time and place of where one is living. I would say target readers are young adults on up who live in rural or semi-urban environments, seeking to find answers to the complexities of relationships that do not necessarily express themselves as easy as one hopes them to be. Robert, once you sat down and started writing Prairie Moon, Blue Moon Bar and Cafe, up until it got published and got out there for readers, how long of a time period was that? Well, there is kind of an interesting situation. I I began writing Prairie Moon as a single fiction book well over 30 years ago. I had 10 chapters written on floppy disks. Oh, wow. As the busyness of life moves forward, though, I subsequently lost all of those Mm. disks. So once I retired from 40 years as an educator, I decided it was time to think about writing that book. This time, as a trilogy, Each book of the trilogy took one year to write. I published the first book in 2019. Then we published this book, Blue Moon Bar and Cafe, in 2020, and then ultimately Sketches in 2021. When it came to taking your written word, the printed word, and making the audiobook version of this, Robert, was that a smooth process? You know, it really was. Hmm. I was really impressed with the publisher. And it was a lot smoother than I thought it was going to be. It was a lot of work, but the back and forth part of that, of the editing and the finalization of the manuscript, turned out to be a much smoother process. I was impressed with the fact that I used a publishing process tool that allowed me to do a lot of that work internal to myself, And then I sent it off to about five different readers who really worked diligently with me to really polish each of the manuscripts. So once the publisher took it, we got it to that point. And then to final, final, it really was a very nice final piece that looked really good, including the cover, the final design. It was very nice. Well, I think readers are going to love this book. It's titled Prairie Moon, Blue Moon Bar and Cafe. It's written by R.L. Mata, and it's published by the Audiobook Network. So head on over to Audible or the Apple iTunes Store or Amazon and pick this book up. 
Robert, thank you again for coming on the show with me and telling me about this book and about your work. I had a really nice time talking. Thank you. I really appreciate it. And thank you for taking the time to visit with me about my book. I'm really happy to be sitting with author Elizabeth Jimenez here at the Reader House Author Roundtable. Elizabeth, welcome to the show. Thank you for joining me. Oh, thank you very much for having me. Very exciting. You have a new book out. It's titled, Jesus, When I Did Not Know You, But You Knew Me, and When We Both Knew Each Other. I love the title of this book, Elizabeth. Can you tell me what it's all about? Yes, I'm quite older. I'm 65, so you go through life not knowing them. I was the Christmas Easter family Mm -hmm. as a kid, and I grew up that way. And so I really never had a relationship, and then as I grew up, I finally got to know that he was there and that with me all the time. And he's always with me now. (laughs) Were you writing to any specific group of readers? Did you have a target audience in mind, Elizabeth? Well, I I figured everybody has, you know, maybe this can help everybody. I didn't have a target. If somebody doesn't have a relationship with Jesus, I hope that this helps them too. So I, I guess that's my target. Can you go back and think about that moment, that spark that was lit that made you think, wow, I have to sit down and get started writing this book? Well, the Lord put it on my heart to write this book, and I'm not a writer. Mm. (laughs) And at first, I wrote a prayer, and I send it to this priest and his caregiver, and I write that in the book, how that happened. And I sent them the prayer and thought, oh, he's going to write a book, and it'll go in there, and everything will be fine. But what you think and what the Lord wants you to do is two different things. So Mm. that didn't happen, so I expanded on that prayer, and a book came out of it with God's help. How long of a time frame was that? Did it take a long time for you to write and then get published? Yes, because, like I said, I'm not a writer. It took like seven to eight years. Mm. But something would always bring me back to it. I would write a little bit more of it. And finally, I'm amazed that it is completed. (laughs) And, you know, with God's help, everything. Anybody that wants to write, you just got to keep at it, and it'll come to fruition. I have to imagine the day that your first copy came in, Elizabeth, and you got to hold that book in your hands and look at the cover with your name on it and everything. That had to be quite a day. What was that moment like for you? Yes. Like my daughter always tells me, what are you trying to tell me? You know, because I have it in my mind, but I have a hard time telling you, you know, what I want to say. So when I saw this book and even she said, oh, my, I was amazed how my family was amazed. And I was just amazed also that the Lord blessed me to put a book out for him. And it came to be. <laughs> Do you think we'll see more books from you in the future? Right now, this is it for me. Hmm. But you never know. God has a mind. <laughs> Elizabeth, what would you say was the most challenging part of the whole process for you? Was it the writing of the book or was it something during the publishing process? It's the writing for me. The publishing, I had a good experience with Mm -hmm. them going back and forth. And, you know, you got to keep up with it and see what they, you know, because they have a certain, they write it and I don't know how to say this, but they write it in a certain grammar. Mm -hmm. And so what I was trying to convey was not coming out. I would write what I wanted to write, and they were good. And my problem was writing it, you know, because mm-hmm. I would stop and I would write and I would stop and forget about it a little while and then write, come back and read it and start. So mine was writing. Everything else really went good after that mm-hmm. once I finished it. Elizabeth, can you tell me about the cover? You have the most touching photo on there. Can you give me a little background on that? Well, in one of my stories is it when my childhood that. I had asthma as a kid, and I would put my head out the window while I was laying down and trying to get air. And so I asked my granddaughter, this is my little granddaughter, and I said, can you kneel down right there in front of the window? And I took a picture, and I this is like four years ago, this picture. Oh, wow. I wanted to use it, you know, because there's the window, and it's showing, you know, if that was me, that's what I was doing, trying to get air, just any kind of air as a kid. But the Lord blessed me to outgrow it as an adult, and so I, I never had it after. Well, I think a lot of readers will be blessed by the words in this book. It's titled, Jesus, When I Did Not Know You, But You Knew Me, and When We Both Knew Each Other. This is written by Elizabeth Jimenez, and is published by Christian Faith Publishing. 
and you can get it anywhere. So get on Amazon or Barnes & Noble or iTunes or take a walk down the street to your local bookshop. You can get this book there. Elizabeth, it's been wonderful speaking with you here today all about your work. I had a nice time. Oh, thank you so much for letting me answer your questions. I appreciate it. Words to Live By. That's the name of the new book that just hit stores, written by T.R. Robinson. And right now at the Reader House Author Roundtable, we're going to talk all about that book. T.R. is sitting right next to me. T.R., welcome to the show. Thank you so much for joining me. It's great to be here. It's great to have you on. Can you tell me what readers are in store for with Words to Live By? Yes, this book is more than just a Christian-based inspirational book. I really wrote it as a guide to help people seek out, compile, and live life according to their own unique set of words that encourages hope and will leave a legacy that others can follow with a can-do mentality. It's my hope this book will um, serve as a catalyst for the reader to live a life on purpose, uh, following God's will, and to define their meaning of success and achievement based upon relationships they nurture with others, and to become an overcomer, never give up when faced with the inevitable hurdles, obstacles, and disappointments we all experience in life. Mm. So that's really a summation of what the book's all about. T.R., what was your inspiration for this book? Where'd the idea come from? The idea came from a couple of different places. I was in the uh, middle of writing a book with my mom, compiling stories. Uh, She was a gal from the hills and hollers of West Virginia, a place called Bull Creek, West Virginia. And she had some great, great stories to tell about her life growing up there in Bull Creek. And we were compiling that and putting it together. And unfortunately, in the middle of doing all this, COVID took her. She passed away. Oh, I'm sorry. And so there I sat with, you know, a list of a bunch of stories, some poignant, some funny, most of them funny, because she loved to laugh. And I started thinking, you know what, I could honor her by broadening this book out to be just more than more than just a compilation of stories. But, you know, I wanted to enlarge the topic to include stories of my life, because I've overcome a number of things and stories about those people who have influenced my life. You know, we have influencers today that are based on clicks on a computer and in the Internet, and uh, my influencers are people like, you know, Winston Churchill, Davy Crockett, mm. and a number of other people who have had a positive impact on my life. And T.R., once that day came and the physical copy came in and you got to hold words to live by for the first time, what kind of a moment was that for you? Well, it was a, it was really a surreal moment for me because it was a culmination of, you know, creating something, taking it from an idea germinated in my mind to a physical reality. My wife and I, when the box came with all the books, we, we laughed for like a half an hour. <laughs> you know, it was joy, pure joy. And a lot of people listening right now are authors who are new to all of this. They're just starting out. TR, have you learned anything along the way that you could pass on to them? Yes. The one thing that I learned was what made the process easier for me is I did my research on publishers that specialized in the genre that I was writing in. Mm. That's number one in terms of submitting your manuscript. I did a lot of research on how to submit manuscripts, what they're looking for, and you know, put together a package to uh, send to my publisher, Covenant Books. What do you think the chances are that we'll be seeing more from you here in the future? Well, I'm in the process. I've just finished another book. I'm very diverse in my interests, and I've written a book on how to buy and sell real estate, residential homes, based on my experience as a realtor. So I've, I've finished that manuscript, and I've, I'm just going to start. I'll be searching publishers on that. And then I'm also writing a science fiction book. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah, that combines time travel and political intrigue. I have a master's degree in international politics and economics, so I'm kind of applying a future dystopian world that's been taken over by what's called the Unified Community, which was developed or created out of the ruins of the United Nations and an authoritarian government and people traveling back in time to our day to try to stop that from occurring. I think a lot of people are going to love this book. I encourage everybody listening to seek this out. It's titled Words to Live By. It's written by T.R. Robinson, 
It's published by Covenant Books, and you can find it anywhere, so head over to Amazon or Barnes & Noble or iTunes, or take a walk down the street to your local bookshop, you can pick this one up. TR, it's been really great having you on the show. Thank you so much for your time. Yes, thank you for your time. I appreciate it. This audiobook is a fascinating coming-of-age story of romance and heartache set against the backdrop of the Jersey Shore. It's called Wildwood Nights. It's written by Marguerite Pacholsky, and we get to talk about it right now here at the Reader House Author Roundtable. Marguerite is right here with me. Marguerite, welcome. Thank you so much for being here. Oh, thanks for having me. Marguerite, this sounds really captivating. Wildwood Nights, can you tell me about it? So my story is about a girl who is escaping her father. It's set in 1979 down at the Jersey Shore, you know, Wildwood Nights. When she's escaping to there, she meets a rock singer down there, and they end up in a relationship, and things happen. She ends up running away to Wildwood. Now, Wildwood's a place that I used to spend my summers when I was young, Mm -hmm. and I often uh, would go to see some rock bands myself in the different clubs. But anyway, she falls in love with this guy and ends up getting in a relationship, and things that happen during this relationship kind of seal their fate together. His feelings about her were very conflicted at times, but after they got tangled together, they just end up living their life together, and then things unfold from there. Marguerite, it sounds like a lot of your own story went into this, am I right? Well, actually, I'm a night shift nurse, and at night shift, we used to tell a lot of stories, and there was, the only rule was it couldn't be boring. So everybody <laughs> would tell the stories of their most craziest nights. And then I took all these stories and I put them all together and put it on this one character. I love it. And that's where the book comes from. So even though it's fiction, the feelings and emotions and the things that actually happen are, for the most part, true. I love it. Marguerite, have you ever done anything like this before when it comes to writing or anything? What's your writing background look like? Well, actually, when I got to 40 years old, I just decided, you know, the only limitations on my life were the ones that I put there. Mm -hmm. So I decided at that point I was just going to start trying to do things that i never done before. I always liked writing and I always liked telling stories. So at that point, I thought, you know what? I am just going to try writing a romance novel. So I sat down and that's what I did. I wrote this book. I took these stories from all the people I knew. I never tell anybody who the stories are from. (laughs) But then more and more people would give me stories and then I started writing more and more books. And if you would ask me back then if I would ever show anybody besides my friend's book, (laughs) the answer was no. But, you know, as you get older, I'm I'm 60 now, and, you know, you get a little bolder and you start thinking, I don't really care as much what other people think. (laughs) You know, if my friends enjoy this, maybe other people would too. And it turns out a lot of people do enjoy the book. So, you know, I got less shy about, you know, putting it out there. That's wonderful. Now, Marguerite, being your first book, did this one take you, like, forever to write? No, it really didn't take as long as I would you would think. Mm-hmm. Once I decided I was going to write it, it's like I had so many stories kind of rolling in my mind that, you know, I just thought everybody did that. But I almost had it all worked out before I ever even put pen to paper. Oh, wow. You know, because when I first wrote it, I wrote it <laughs> out on paper and then put it in the computer. My biggest thing was when I was 60 years old, I wanted to have three books published. And that's I did the self-publishing, and that's what happened. Oh, that's awesome. Marguerite, a lot of people listening right now are authors just starting out, maybe haven't published yet. So do you have any words of wisdom that you could pass on to them? You know what? I had a neighbor after I wrote my books, and he was saying he wanted to write a book, always wanted to write a book, and he had an outline, had all this. He said he couldn't write the first sentence, Mm -hmm. so he couldn't write his book. I said, well, write the ending. You don't have to have this all in a row. If you have a a phrase or something like that, write these all down and put it all together. It doesn't have to go from beginning to end. It can go any way you want it to go. And I think this book is a good read, too. It's titled Wildwood Nights. It's written by Marguerite Pacholsky. And it's published by the Audiobook Network, and you can find that anywhere. So Audible or the iTunes Store or Amazon, anywhere that you get your audiobooks. Marguerite, it's been wonderful speaking with you here tonight and learning all about your passionate work. I love it. Thank you so much for joining me. Oh, thank you for having me. 
This is the thrilling tale of two lovers and their family's role in their magical world's history. The name of the book is The Curus Chronicles, Chronicle 1, and the author, J.S. Lohman, is sitting right here with me now at the Reader House Author Roundtable, and we get to talk all about this book. J.S., welcome to the show. Thanks so much for being here. Why, Corey, thank you for having me. The pleasure's all mine. Now, the audiobook just came out of The Curse Chronicles, Chronicle 1. So, J.S., can you tell me what readers are in store for here? Well, you know, actually, I'm hoping that they're going to be enthralled by the work that I've done. The Curse Chronicles, the first one here, is an introduction into the world in which Curse and Virago live and an introduction to members of their family. And so I'm hoping that I can whet their appetite for more of the tales of Curse and Rock and the Curse Chronicles. Mm. Would you say this is a book that fantasy readers would love the most? Oh, I'm hoping so. My um, target audience is actually fantasy sword and sorcery lovers, fantasy fans, and D&D players throughout the world. Mm. And where did the idea for this come from? I love the idea for the story here. Uh, what was that spark? Well, actually, Curse and Rock were two of the characters that decades ago I used to play in Dungeons and Dragons. And so these tales are inspired by events that happened in those Dungeons and Dragon games and all of the things that transpired and evolved from that. It's kind of like fantasy reality, mimicking reality fantasy. <laughs> when it comes to writing and, and publishing and everything, JS, is this your first time? Yes, it is. And so I'm hoping people will um, bear with me, <laughs> try to make it as entertaining as I could. And I'm told that it's pretty entertaining, so we'll see how it works out. Now, being your first book, did it take you a really long time to write and then put through that publishing process? Actually, it took me, from the actual time I started sitting down and writing, it took about two years to get to completion, which isn't a long time at all from what I'm told. My audiobook publisher, Audiobook Network, they found me the best narrator I could have looked for anywhere, Corey, in Gil Mills. She has done such a fantastic job of telling the story from Aura's perspective. And that's who the narration's coming from in the book is Aura, one of the characters. Then after all that time and so much hard work that goes into something like writing and publishing a book, J.S., the day finally comes. You get your first physical copy, and you get to hold this thing with your name on the cover that you've put so much time and effort into. What was that moment like for you? It was probably one of the top six moments in my life, mm. the top five being the birth of my five sons. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> but that was it was right up there with those and with marrying my wife. It was pretty intense for it. Wow. A lot of people listening to us right now are authors who are just starting out in this whole world. So, J.S., what have you picked up or learned along the way that maybe you could pass on as some advice? Don't be afraid to take criticism for your work. It'll just make you better. And also, pay attention to the marketing because that's actually the biggest part of getting your book out there mm. is the marketing end of it. And like many writers, I don't have a clue about marketing. <laughs> so I, that would be the one thing I would tell people to try to gain as much knowledge as you can about what you need to do to put your book out there. And J.S., how much of this story was outlined ahead of time and went according to the outline? And how much of this story did you find just happened while you were writing it? Well, naturally, I've done an outline on this is the first of many books, I'm hoping. <laughs> <laughs> I, at least I had the outlines for them. <laughs> But it seemed that in writing it, it would reach points where the characters would literally not let me progress <laughs> until I worked out the part that they were in. It astounded me. I really didn't want to admit that's what was going on, but uh, it's kind of what was going on. <laughs> mm. Well, this story sounds really exciting. I think it's going to be a great series. I encourage everyone listening to go check this out. The title is The Curus Chronicles, Chronicle 1. It's written by J.S. Lohman, and it's published by the Audiobook Network. So head over to Audible or the Apple iTunes Store or Amazon, and you can pick this one up. J.S., thank you so much again for joining me and telling me all about this series, all about your work. I had a nice time. Corey, thank you very much for having me. And hey, I'm about halfway through Part 2. We hope you enjoyed this edition of the Reader House Author Roundtable. 
where authors from all walks of life come together to discuss the trials, tribulations, and triumphs of publishing their books. We hope to see you back here every Friday night at 8 p.m. or listen anytime via podcast at Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, TuneIn, and PodServe, to name just a few. The Author Roundtable is sponsored by Reader House Online Bookstore, where independent new authors come first.